Hi everyone, in this video I'm sharing 5 things that I'm doing to look after my physical and mental health this year. 2021 has been a bit of a roller coaster with the pandemic still happening in full force and so many things happening around the world, so it's been really important to focus on the things that are in our control. Looking after our minds and our bodies is something that's in our control that we can start doing today. And doing this not only benefits you in the long run, but it also makes you feel better right now. As you watch this video, a question that you can think about is, what do I want to do to look after my mind and body? The first on the list is sleep. You might be hearing people talk about the value of sleep a lot lately. And this is because for the longest time we've been hearing things like, sleep is for the weak, I'll sleep when I'm dead. 90% grind, 10% sleep. If you ask me, this is just bad advice that's been thrown around over the years. Yes, you will get more time if you sacrifice sleep, but at what cost? Functioning on limited sleep can be done when you need to do it, but it's not a good idea to do this for a prolonged periods of time if you care about your health and well-being. Over the last couple of years, best-selling books have been released emphasising the importance of sleep. Matthew Walker wrote a book called Why We Sleep and it's a great one because it talks about how important sleep is for our bodies and our minds. According to Matthew Walker, routinely sleeping less than 6 or 7 hours a night demolishes your immune system, disrupts blood sugar levels, blocks your arteries and can cause major psychiatric problems like anxiety and depression. In the short term, it also impacts your ability to focus and concentrate. I know when I haven't slept enough, I often have to read the same line in a book over and over again to process it. And I get a bit more emotional than usual and find it harder to deal with the demands of the day. Some things that I do to ensure that I get a good quality sleep at night are follow an evening routine. From about 7pm when my kids are in bed, I start the evening routine. I close all of the curtains, turn off any overhead lights and use lamps instead. I get changed out of my daytime clothes into something loose and comfortable. After a bit of tidying, the rest of the evening is dedicated to the next part of the evening routine. The next part of the evening routine is unwinding before bed. It's good to have an idea of the activities that help you unwind versus the activities that wake you up. I usually need an activity that helps me recharge enough to be able to enjoy the evening but at the same time unwind enough to get ready for bed. I'm often a zombie at this time of day and need to give myself a little push to pull out the yoga mat or grab a book instead of the remote. But by the end of it, I feel like the thoughts of the day have gently floated away and I have a fresh supply of calming energy for the evening. I often do some work in the evening too, but I try to keep it quite light and not too involving. I set up my studio for the evening so it still feels like it's the evening. I'll light a candle on my desk, get into comfy loungewear and choose the right lighting. And thanks to BenQ who gifted me this e-reading LED lamp, I think I've found the perfect light for this. BenQ have been studying the interaction between people and their lighting environment for years now. Particularly when people are using electronic devices and they've found that most people use inefficient lighting in these scenarios. The first thing that stood out to me about this lamp was how wide and evenly lit the area is when the lamp is on. Usually when I turn a lamp on at my desk, it only lights up a small spot on my desk. This covers an area of 35 inches, which is 150% more than an average desk lamp. Also, with a touch of the ring, a light sensor is activated to detect the brightness of the surroundings. The lamp adjusts for brighter illumination, and the glare from your screen is reduced to provide the best lighting for reading. The lamp also gives you the option to adjust the lighting according to your mood. You can make it warmer for when you're relaxing or cooler when you want to focus and feel more alert. And on a side note, I love how it looks so sleek and unique and that BenQ have said that it's designed to look like a smile-shaped curve to remind the user of the beauty of a smile. If you're interested in seeing the details of this lamp, the one I have is called the Genie e-reading lamp and it's on Amazon. It's quite pricey at $189 because of all the research that's been done and the features that have been built in. I've shared the Amazon link in the description if you're interested. The second point on my list today is looking after my mind. A way that I plan to look after my mind is reading or learning something every day. I feel like my brain will just decay if I don't use it properly and mental stimulation can slow down the decline. 
It can be in any form, reading a book, learning something new by reading an article, watching a TED talk or a documentary. I have a growth spread in my bullet journal to remind me to think about a book that I want to read in the month, an online class I can take on Skillshare, or anything else, audiobooks, activities, hobbies. Then there are some mindset shifts I plan to embrace for better mental health. One of them is to be aware of time anxiety. Time anxiety is a constant worry that you're wasting time or that you need to spend it on something meaningful. According to the clinical psychologist Dr. Alex Lickerman, someone with time anxiety might spend a lot of the day looking at clocks to check the time or over planning things like routes or rushing from one activity to the next, feeling guilty about lost time if you have a lie-in, feeling uneasy if you don't do everything you planned or even just feeling like you're too late to do certain things. Thinking things like, it's too late to write a book about this, or it's too late to start a YouTube channel, or go travelling, or have a big career change. This type of thinking just makes you fixate on missed opportunities, and you stop yourself from seeing the ways that you can actually meet these goals. I've written a whole blog post about this if you want to check it out, and ways to manage it. I'll link it in the description. The ultimate goal for me is to stop linking my well-being to my productivity, or my judgement of how well I think I've spent my time. So to manage it, I'm just going to be aware of it in my daily life and not encourage it. Always be aware of what's meaningful to me through journaling and learning, and then make time for those things. And be more mindful and present throughout the day and reduce distraction. And this will help make space for the activities that do feel good. The other mindset shift that's really good for your mental health is to learn how to choose self-compassion over everything else. According to psychologist Dr. Kristin Neff, self-pity is when you get immersed in your own issues, isolate yourself and forget that others often have to go through similar things too, maybe at different times. Prolonged self-pity can be really unhelpful and lead to self-indulgence, which is saying, I'm stressed out today so I'll just watch TV all day and eat a tub of ice cream. Self-compassion would be acknowledging the stressful day you had and then doing something that's good for you, Not guilting yourself into action, but instead using your compassion for yourself to help you do something positive and maybe watch the Netflix show you wanted to watch after if you still want to. Self-esteem is something we're always working to build, which starts as a genuine attempt to build the confidence that we need to live our lives, and we encourage it in our children too. But according to Dr. Neff, it ends up creating a need to feel better than others or to feel above average, to feel good about ourselves and your self-esteem then changes based on your successes and failures, and you don't really want your well-being to be linked to something as unpredictable as that. Self-compassion, on the other hand, is recognising when you're suffering, being aware that it's usually a shared human experience and it's not just you, which puts things into perspective. It's being gentle with yourself because you recognise that not being perfect, or failing, or experiencing difficulties is inevitable. It happens to everyone and accepting any difficult feelings which helps you let go of them and move on from them. Again, I've written a blog post on this if you want more detail. Number three on the list is food. The food you choose to put into your body makes such a difference to how you feel. This year I've been trying to make better food choices so I can feel my best. I'll be the first to admit that I find it hard to eat healthy food all the time, So if I want to eat well, I have to make it really simple for myself. The first thing is I don't put pressure on myself to cut any foods from my diet. If I want fish and chips on a Friday with my family, I'll have it. I just remember that I want my week to feel balanced, so I'll make healthier choices on the other days. But if you're already a really healthy eater and find it really easy to make the right choices, then this probably isn't relevant for you. Or if you have a particular weight loss goal or physical goals, then you probably have particular eating regimes that you follow already. But if you're like me and you just want to feel healthy and energetic, have good health in the long term, then I find that lifting the pressure and just making better choices 80% of the time can help to slowly work towards a healthier lifestyle that's sustainable in the longer term. The second thing I do with food that helps me stay healthy is eating until I'm satisfied rather than stuffed. From a young age, we're always pushed to finish everything on our plates, and as toddlers, our plates are prepared by the grown-ups based on how much they think we should be eating, and we'd have to finish everything on that plate. But we all have different bodies and feel satisfied at different points, 
so we could end up getting into the habit of eating until we're really stuffed, which isn't good for our bodies, our energy levels or our long-term health. I hate food waste, so I always make sure I prepare my own plate. I won't even let my husband put anything on my plate because if I end up with too much, I feel pressurised to have a clean plate at the end of my meal and feel really full. Number four, staying active. I know you probably hear this a lot, but movement really does help to keep you healthy and happy. I don't go crazy with working out, I just try to live by this quote. Take care of your body, it's the only place you have to live in. Because I don't set aside huge chunks of time to go to the gym, one thing I try to do is make sure I'm on my feet as much as possible. I try to go for a walk every day, like I'm sure a lot of people do. For me, going out for a walk snaps me out of lethargic or lazy moods and makes me come back feeling a bit more energetic and ready to tackle my tasks. I have a wellness tracker in my bullet journal which I colour in whenever I do something active like a run, a bike ride, yoga or weights. Sometimes I might get really into something like CrossFit or running or weightlifting, so I might have periods of time when I'm doing more of something. But on the whole, I just want to be able to look at this wellness tracker and see lots of activity. I also aim to do yoga a few times a week. I had a bit of a break from yoga and the thing that turned things around for me was doing a 30-day yoga program called Breath. This was on YouTube and the requirement to show up every day for the program got me back into the habit of doing yoga every day and feeling the benefits of it. So now that the program is over, I'm comfortable with just doing as much of it as I can in a week by following the Yoga with Adrian calendar. It doesn't end up being every day, which is fine, because I feel like even a few times a week is helpful. Intense bursts like 30-day programs and challenges can really get the ball rolling and pull you into the habit of doing something again, if you need to give yourself a boost. Finally, number five is connection. Robert Waldinger, a Harvard psychiatrist, has devoted his life to studying people and found that people who see more people tend to live longer and healthier compared with people who are more socially isolated. In this study, those who had warm, closer relationships and were more socially connected to others aged better, stayed healthier as they got older and lived longer. They argue that family gatherings, getting together with friends and getting involved in community or work-related activities can influence our long-term health, just as much as sleep, a good diet and not smoking. They found that a lack of social ties is associated with depression, cognitive decline and mortality. So just doing things like spending quality time with loved ones, be there with them fully without getting distracted, connect with a friend or family member in a day, say hello to the person you see every day when you're out for a walk, or find a connection with a parent that you see on the school run every day. You can even feel connected to people in creative ways, So I'll try to take inspiration from my dear friend who sent me this little note just to say congratulations for reaching my one year YouTube anniversary. Or this lovely card I got from my sister-in-law when I decided to leave my corporate job and start a new career. Things like this just make you feel that people are on this life journey with you and you feel connected in a special way. So if you can find ways to connect with others in this way, not only do you make someone's day, but you also experience the joy of giving and feeling connected to others. Jay Shetty, the author of Think Like a Monk, says, I think today the challenge is we're surrounded by people, but we still feel lonely. We're constantly completely filled up with friends and followers, but no one to call in a time of need. With social media interactions, I think that the key thing that I always want to remember is to just be authentic in my interactions and be myself. That's the only way to have genuine interactions with others and build meaningful relationships. And I think when you have that, you're less likely to feel negative about social media and have a mostly positive experience of it. I really hope you enjoyed watching this and hopefully felt inspired to do something positive for your own health and well-being too. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.